Hello and welcome to 7 Days of Science. In the headlines this week, there's been a new species of mosasaur named after the world serpent Jormungandr, the discovery of what could be the oldest ever Spinosaur fossil, a new species of Titanosaur named, and much more. Starting off the news this week, a pair of papers published in the Astronomical Journal have shown how dangerous massive planets and other systems can be for their neighbours. One particular system of study for the astronomers was a system with the not particularly memorable name of HD141399. This system has four giant planets orbiting its star, and this has a great effect on the smaller planets in the system. The question of whether or not the Earth could survive in the habitable zone of this star was looked into, and the conclusion was yes, but a shaky one. A planet like Earth could survive in the system's gravitational zone, but it would be very unlikely due to the gravitational influence of these four giant planets that could destabilise in Earth's orbit and send it outside the habitable zone. There are very few areas in the system where an Earth-like planet could survive. Another system, called Gliese 357, has a massive, almost certainly uninhabitable planet actually sitting in its habitable zone. This planet would have a similar destructive effect on any planet hoping to host life, as its mass and gravitational influence would distort the orbits of other planets so much that their highly elliptical orbits would cause some really crazy climates. One researcher called their paper a warning that when we find planets in the habitable zone, not to assume they are automatically capable of hosting life. Also in the news this week, researchers have published a pair of papers showing for the first time that chimpanzees can undergo menopause. Within the scientific community, it has been accepted for a while that only a few species of animal go through menopause. Along with humans, orcas and some other species of cetaceans live well past the age at which they are able to reproduce. Now, chimpanzees have also been added to the list of species that go through it. Since 1995, researchers have been tracking a group of chimpanzees in Kibali National Park called the Ungogo Group, and noticed that quite a few of the female chimps were living way past the birth of their last offspring. In fact, they were surviving around 8 years longer, which is about 20% of their adult life. As well as using demographic data to determine how long the females survived after the birth of their last offspring, they also collected urine samples and measured levels of four reproductive hormones. In humans, concentrations of two of these hormones drop once reproduction ends, whereas the levels of the other two go up. The same pattern was seen in the chimps, confirming that they had indeed gone through menopause, and that a lack of offspring was not as a result of disease. The menopause does not seem to occur in other groups of chimps, however, including their neighbours. Most female chimps don't live past the age of 50, while the Ungogo group of females are surviving well into their 60s, due to a better diet, less predation and less interaction with humans. The best known explanation for the evolution of menopause is called the grandmother effect, the idea that older females without young of their own are better able to help raise their grandchildren, thus enhancing their own reproductive success. However, chimps are not involved in helping to raise their grandchildren, so for them the grandmother hypothesis does not explain why they go through menopause. Scientists suggest that the discovery of menopause in chimps doesn't invalidate the grandmother hypothesis for humans, only that grandparent care alone is not the reason why menopause evolved. First up in the paleontology news for this week is a very intriguing paper reporting on a possible fossil belonging to a Jurassic Spinosaurid. Spinosaurids are currently only known from the Cretaceous period, but are thought to have originated at some point during the older Jurassic, though direct evidence for their early evolution is currently lacking. This new discovery, an isolated toe claw from Middle Jurassic aged rocks in northwestern India, has been analysed by paleontologists using various methods and is found to be very similar to the anatomy of Spinosaurid toe claws. It's very triangular in shape, it's elongate and it is quite flat along the bottom with a shallow depression, all of which are seen in the toe claws of Spinosaurus itself. As such, they tentatively identify the claw as coming from a basally branching Spinosaurid, which would make this the oldest record of a Spinosaurid if confirmed by more complete remains. So, a very exciting and tantalising discovery that will hopefully be followed by more fossils, enabling us to gain a better understanding of where and when these spectacular dinosaurs first evolved. Also in this week's news, there's been the report of a newly identified fossil assemblage found in southern Poland. 
It dates to the Middle Triassic period, approximately 240 million years ago, and preserves all sorts of vertebrate fossils, very significant as the evolution of land vertebrates in the Mid Triassic is still poorly understood. The environment that all these animals lived in seems to have been a shallow, brackish body of water with a lot of terrestrial input, and the remains of many fish, amphibians, and reptiles have all been uncovered here. One of the most notable aspects of the assemblage, though, is the surprising abundance of the incredibly long necked marine reptile, Tanistrophius. Fossils of this amazing animal make up more than half of the large vertebrate specimens found from the bone bed concentrations at the site, leading the paleontologists to hypothesize that the depositional setting here is closely connected to the favored habitat of these reptiles. There's also some variation in the remains of these animals, suggesting that another kind of Tanistrophid is likely present at this locality too. So another amazing discovery, giving us many new kinds of fossils, as well as providing some more insight into the paleobiology of the wonderfully strange Tanistrophius. Also in the news this week, Ragnarok has arrived. A new species of Mosasaur has been discovered and named Jormungandr valhallaensis. This mosasaur was unearthed in rocks of the Pierre Shale Formation in North Dakota, and dates back to the Campanian stage of the Late Cretaceous, about 80 million years ago. Not only is Jormungandr just the perfect name for a mosasaur, referring to the giant world serpent of Norse mythology, but it's also particularly appropriate for this species as the fossils were found near the town of Valhalla, North Dakota, which is also honored in the species name Valhallaensis. The material known for Jormungandr comprises an almost complete skull and mandibles, all seven of the neck vertebrae, 11 ribs, and five vertebrae from the back. The skull measures 72 centimeters long, or about 2.36 feet, and the total body length has been estimated at 7.3 meters, or 24 feet. It's found to be a close relative of the small mosasaurine Clydastes, however the paleontologists explain that they expect the placement of Jormungandr among other mosasaurs to change in future studies once more species are discovered and more anatomical characters added into the analyses of their relationships, better clarifying how they are all related to each other. They also suspect that Jormungandr might represent a sort of transitional branch between more basal and more derived mosasaurines, as it displays a mixture of anatomical features. Jormungandr is now also one of the northernmost occurrences of mosasaurines from the western interior seaway that used to split North America, expanding the known range of these reptiles. Interestingly, some bite marks were also found on one of the vertebrae from the back, which don't show any signs of healing, and therefore probably occurred either close to the time of death, or afterwards. Although the culprits can't be identified for sure, the bites may have been inflicted by another mosasaur, and possibly even another Jormungandr individual, as is reconstructed in the beautiful paleoart that accompanies the study. So a fantastic new discovery and a wonderful paper describing this new mosasaur. This week has also seen the naming and description of a new dinosaur species too. Found in late Cretaceous aged rocks in Patagonia, it's a new kind of titanosaurian sauropod named Inawentu oslatus. Incredibly, the fossil material found of this species includes part of the hips and a complete vertebral sequence from the hips to the neck, plus an almost complete skull, which is very exciting as sauropod skulls are some of the rarest dinosaur fossils of all. Inawentu is also a very interesting sauropod as it has enabled paleontologists to recognize this species, along with various others, as representing a distinct group of endemic Upper Cretaceous South American titanosaurs, which they name Clade A. Inawentu also shows some features that have convergently evolved with an older, unrelated group of sauropods called the Rebachisaurids, namely the very wide snout that appears quite spatulate in addition to a relatively short neck. It therefore seems that Inawentu and other members of Clade A, which potentially also have a skull and jaw anatomy like this, occupied a similar low browsing niche to the older Rebachisaurids and ended up evolving very similar adaptations, despite being on a completely different branch of the sauropod family tree. So not only is this an incredible new sauropod species, revealing much more about the anatomy of these dinosaur skulls, but it's also an amazing instance of convergent evolution within sauropods. And finally for the news this week, a new study has looked at the impact that fine silicate dust had on the environment when it was ejected into the atmosphere 66 million years ago by the Chicxulub asteroid impact. It's long been suggested that the impact triggered a global winter, 
resulting in the extinction of many organisms, including the non-avian dinosaurs. But the exact changes to the climate that the different types of debris ejected into the atmosphere caused have been debated. This new study therefore presents paleoclimate simulations based on sedimentological samples from a locality in North Dakota that preserves deposits dating to the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary, to see what the relative effects of sulfur, soot, and silica dust were. As it turns out, the size distribution of the silica dust shows that there was a larger contribution of fine dust to the global cooling than was previously realised, and this dust had a long atmospheric lifetime, about 15 years, contributing to the fall of global average surface temperatures of up to 15 degrees Celsius. Photosynthesis may also have been completely shut down for as long as two years after the impact, due to changes in solar radiation reaching the surface induced by the dust. So, some very interesting simulations illustrating how catastrophic this asteroid impact was on the ecosystems of the time. Well, that's it for the news this week. I really hope you enjoyed learning about everything that's happened in the last seven days of science. I also just wanted to mention that in a few days' time, I'm going to be heading off to Morocco to do some paleontological fieldwork there. I'm going to be exploring various localities that expose the famous Chemchem group, home to Spinosaurus itself, and I'm very excited to see what fossils we might find out there. I'm planning to post a lot about the expedition on my Instagram and also show some extra content to all our channel members, so do be sure to follow my Instagram account and become a member if you would like to. I'll be filming the whole thing as well and making some videos about the journey that will be uploaded on the channel eventually, so I hope you enjoy that too when it's done. Anyway, thank you for watching and I'll see you soon.